I have some great HOA stories for you today, and you're going to love that title story too. Check out this video in podcast form by searching Austin Stories wherever you listen, or check the video description for a link. Here's our first one. Can you be forced into an HOA and made to follow their rules? About 15 years ago, my brother bought a farm in Ontario, Canada, near a medium-sized city. In the last five years or so, an upper middle class subdivision popped up beside of him, which for the most part wasn't much of a problem. Today, he had the president of the HOA for the subdivision come over to him and tried to issue him demands and fines for violating their rules. His farm was originally established in the late 1800s and the subdivision was built around 2010, so it's not like he was part of them when they were built. The HOA is saying that he is creating a public nuisance by spreading manure on his fields. He rents most of them out to a neighbor since he works in the city for the most part, along with demanding that he stop doing things like using his smoker, using farm equipment near the subdivision, cease commercial enterprises, and stop using his impact gun because the noise and smoke is apparently very disruptive to the community a kilometer or so away. The president of the HOA also demanded a ridiculous amount in past dues along with other fines that he needs to supposedly pay to the president and not the HOA. My brother took the papers and told the guy in no kind words to never come back with papers demanding money unless he was with a lawyer or a cop that'll back him up on his bullcrap. He also has an appointment with a lawyer Thursday to talk about this, but in the meantime, I just wanted to know if there was anything my brother should do to prepare for his meeting with the lawyer. The only issue I think he might have is that he has guard donkeys protecting his wife's sheep. She loves knitting and creating things with the wool, so he has some of the meanest donkeys I've ever seen guarding them from coyotes. Some of the kids from the subdivision come around to look at the sheep, but he has a lot of signs warning about the dangers of the donkeys. Realistically, he can't secure a kilometer or so of fence fully against children, so should he be worried? He has chicken wire stapled up along the fence so no little kids can easily crawl through, and there's signs to warn the older ones that the donkeys are not to be trifled with. Is there anything he should be doing or working on to help himself out? We both think the president of the HOA is talking out of his butt, but I'm slightly worried that if a kid gets bitten or trampled by a donkey, that he will be in trouble, and the president of the HOA could use that against him. What should my brother do aside from document to help himself against the HOA president and to make sure that no little kids get hurt by the donkeys? Is he going about this right, or is there something else that he should do to legally help himself? Do you agree with this answer? If your brother owns the land and did not incorporate his property into the HOA, then the HOA can do nothing about his farm. He should have his lawyer write a cease and desist letter to stop the harassment about the HOA. He should also talk to the lawyer about the farm animals potentially being an attractive nuisance. I don't imagine on a farm that animals would be, though, and what the appropriate signage he'd need, such as beware of donkey and no trespassing. The president of the HOA and the parents of the injured child would be two completely different parties, unless it's the president's child, so the HOA can't do anything about that. The lawyer is his best bet. Explain the situation clearly, bring the land deed and a survey, if he has it, and deliver a timeline of events. An update. As it turns out, my brother already had his property surveyed when he was working with a neighbor to rent out some of the fields, and from what he says, there's a 0% chance that anyone from the subdivision actually owns any of his land. He debated getting another survey done, but he was pretty sure that the letter from the lawyer would be enough. The lawyer seemed pretty helpful, and my brother sounded really happy with how the meeting went. Apparently, it didn't look to the lawyer like he was doing anything that couldn't be seen as normal farm practices, so we shouldn't worry about being sued for the spreading of the manure. The donkeys and the sheep were discussed, but they ended up deciding that he would just increase his insurance, add more warning signs, and fully wrap the wooden fence with new sheep fence along with replacing the older fencing. He also got a letter that, from what he read to me, seems to cover the fact that he isn't doing anything that could be considered unusual farming practices. It also showed that he actually owns the land and said that, unless the HOA has a dissenting survey, they have no claim to his land. It ended up saying that the HOA president should contact the lawyer and not my brother if he has any further issues. Interestingly enough, the lawyer couldn't find any homeowners association under the name the guy had given my brother. He said it's possible they just formed or changed their name, but more than likely, it's just some busybody sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. There's a small chance that they unofficially formed an HOA and never actually did anything but give themselves a name and some rules, 
But the lawyer said that if they did, it wouldn't change the fact that they can't force him to join. So my brother and his wife are happy that things seem to have been resolved. He bought a security camera for the front door so that he can have a recording if the guy shows up again. But that's hopefully the end of it. Now I'm no lawyer, but if you don't know about a situation like this and things can go wrong, it's best to get somebody that knows what the heck they're talking about. I bought my home in 2001 in a 42 home community. We bought right after 9-11 and we picked the community because the HOA fees were very low at just $51. It wasn't long after that we bought the home in the community, we got a sweet deal because of this and the business had really slowed after 9-11, before those dues started going up. I was 22 at the time. Looking into the financial reports and into the meetings, it became very clear why the dues were going up. The board was a little fiefdom set up by the developers of the homes. Our management company was a subsidiary corporation of the home builder, and the board members were a combination of one of the home developers and two of the very first home purchasers in the community, a three-person board. The first action the board took with that increase in funds was to remove trees that were not even on the HOA's property. They were trees that sat in an area that the HOA had access to for weed abatement. These trees real crime was not that they were weeds, it was that they blocked the nice view of the board's president and vice president. At the same time, the bullcrap violation letters started going out to about half of the homes. You aren't mowing enough. You aren't watering enough. Every petty thing that you can think of, they were issuing warning letters and starting to fine homeowners. Cue revenge time after getting one of those letters myself about weed abatement. Ironically, it was researching the community's CCNRs about weed abatement that led me to realize the trees that were cut were not on HOA property, and it was researching the annual budget that led me to finding out the huge weed abatement expense that was actually the community's funds being spent to remove trees solely for the two board members' homeowners' views. I then found out that in California, all anyone needs to initiate a recall of the entire board and install a new one, if successful, was the signatures of 5% of the homeowners delivered to the current board. That's a total of three houses in a 42-home community. The board was issued a recall notice not 48 hours after that I'd found out about the law, delivered to the management company in person. Ironically, the home builder's corporate office was in the exact same building as the management company. You think they would have wanted to not make their association so obvious, but hey, it was 2002. This is also when I found out that the management company basically had the entire board in its pocket because they dragged their feet with the recall vote. They set it as far out as they could by law in the middle of the day. Instead of holding it in the community like all board meetings, they set the place at a local park a couple of miles away. They thought they were so brilliant doing this. So, me and my wife put together a proxy voting form for the election, and we went to every door in our community. We told them what was happening with their money, their plans to create an architecture committee that would require all homeowners to get approvals for any additions or changes, and everything. It took us three rounds around the neighborhood, plus a couple of extra visits to homes that had not answered initially. In the end, me and my wife had 26 revocable proxies for the election, for those unfamiliar with proxies, it basically gave me and my wife the power to cast that homeowner's vote for them, if and only if they didn't show up to the election. The thoughtless board and management company actually made it easier for us to collect the proxies, because a lot of homeowners flat out could not make the time and place of the meeting. The recall day finally arrives. The current board members are all there, the management company representative is there, and eight other homeowners showed up to the meeting six of whom we had proxies for and which were revoked by their attendance. They opened the meeting and started saying something about, oh, looks like a waste of money, there isn't a quorum, blah, blah. I then said, I'm sorry, but we do have a quorum. They're like, uh, no, you don't. You need 22 homeowners here. And there's only 12. The three board members, me and wifey, and the eight others that showed up. And that's when I pulled out the trump card. I dropped all 26 proxies on the bench table that everyone was sitting at and said, Hey, I'm sorry, but there are more than 30 homeowners present, and then I pointed out the math. After subtracting the six homeowners that had showed up, we had 20 additional proxy votes that counted for both quorum and voting purposes. They all got wide-eyed, most especially the management company representative. He came over and looked at the forms very closely and compared it against a list of the homeowners. 
Even the people that were there and on our side did not realize how much work we had done to ensure the bullcrap ended there and now. The recall meeting was opened. The board members voted not to recall, plus their three friends that were on their side. The other homeowners present voted to recall, and the vote stood at 6-6, six to six, tied. I then stood and declared that we were voting our 20 valid proxy votes to recall the entire board. Recall passed, 26 votes to 6. The next vote, who replaces the board members? It ended up becoming me and wifey and another homeowner that had voted for the recall and was willing to take the seat. We elected ourselves to the board seats by a vote of 26 to 6. It was at this point that the management company then stated that Canon Management was immediately resigning as the management company for the community. I then pulled out the HOA's management contract, which clearly stated that either side needed to give three months' notice to effect resignation, and stated that we, the new board, accepted their resignation and set an end date for their services three months later. The management guy was nuclear ticked off. I, a 22-year-old kid at the time, had beaten them at their game, and I had prepared for their possible quitting shenanigan. We replaced the management company after a couple of months, having had proper time to find and vet an independent company, at about half the cost, no less. Did the same with the gardening services, which was also a home builder affiliated company, also at about half the cost. The old president of the HOA put his home up for sale about a month later after we rescinded all the old violations and issued a notice to the old board members that we intended to vote on whether they had committed fraud against the association over their weed abatement tree removal action. I still vividly remember walking over to Dell's house, the old president, the day that he was moving and giving him a big wave goodbye as he was getting into the car to follow his moving truck. He gave me the finger as he drove out definitely one of the proudest moments in my life. Is this not full HOA takedown? They don't think you're going to do it, but you do your research and you take them out. What would you do? So, you won't believe the crazy showdown I had with the infamous HOA Karen who's been giving me heck for the past few months. Grab a drink and get comfy, cause this story is a wild ride. It all started when I moved into my dream house, this lovely little place nestled at the edge of a peaceful suburban neighborhood. Now. Let me clarify one thing right away. I'm not part of the HOA and I never plan to be. That's where Karen enters the scene. HOA Karen, who apparently thinks that she owns the entire neighborhood, made it her mission to get me into that HOA. She would bombard my mailbox with these fancy brochures, telling me how they'd make our neighborhood the epitome of perfection. But I'd seen enough stories to know how some HOAs can be a nightmare so I politely declined. That's when the chaos began. Karen, who lived a few houses down, suddenly declared herself the queen of the neighborhood, or at least she acted like it. She started sending me all these letters and emails, claiming I was violating the mysterious and ever-changing rules of the HOA. She'd snap pictures of my yard, my fence, and even my mailbox as if they were federal offenses. I was having none of it. I checked my property deed and I confirmed there was no HOA clause, which I made very clear to Karen. She wasn't pleased. Every minor thing turned into a war. I left my trash can out too long, Karen reported it. My mailbox was the wrong shade of beige, you guessed it, Karen reported it. I'd go about my business, and then there she was, knocking on my door, wearing her I am the law expression pointing out all the things that I needed to fix. It was like living next to a walking, talking citation book. One day, she claimed my rose bushes were violating some HOA guideline, and I'd had enough. I decided to have a calm, mature conversation with her. I know, crazy, right? But it seemed like the only way to settle this nonsense. So I invited Karen over. We sat in my backyard, sipping on iced tea. I tried to reason with her, explaining that I wasn't part of the HOA and she couldn't enforce their rules on my property. She, of course, disagreed, saying something about the greater good and property values. That's when I realized that Karen wasn't just an ordinary misguided neighbor, she was a full-fledged HOA vigilante convinced that she had a divine mandate to regulate everything. It was like dealing with the self-appointed sheriff of suburbia. But I was determined to stand my ground. 
I told her that I wasn't going to change a thing on my property unless it was actually against city ordinances or the law. It felt like a small victory, but it was one that gave me a bit of relief. Of course, that didn't stop Karen. She'd lurk in her garden, watching me like a hawk. If I parked my car in the wrong direction for two seconds too long, she'd be on the phone to the HOA, demanding my immediate expulsion from the neighborhood. She even tried to organize a neighborhood meeting to get me kicked out. It all came to a head one sunny afternoon when I spotted Karen removing some potted plants from my front porch. I couldn't believe it. She was trespassing. I stormed out, yelling for her to stop. It was like a scene from one of those cheesy action movies, but with garden tools instead of guns. We got into a heated argument right there on my porch. I called her out on trespassing, and she retaliated by claiming that my porch plants violated HOA rules. I told her that was nonsense, but she insisted that they were against the greater good or something equally absurd. That's when I decided that I'd had enough. I wasn't going to let Karen push me around anymore. I reached out to the HOA board directly and I informed them of Karen's behavior, attaching evidence of her violations which I had been meticulously documenting for a while. To my surprise, the HOA took it seriously. They launched an investigation into Karen's actions and I could see her furious as the board inspected her property. She couldn't have expected this twist. Sure enough, they found numerous violations on her property, from unkempt lawns to unauthorized structures. She was fined a substantial amount, and she was livid. She accused me of being a snitch, but I couldn't care less. The tables had turned, and for the first time in a long while, I had the upper hand. Karen had been so focused on enforcing her own version of suburban law that she had ignored the actual rules and regulations. She stopped harassing me after the HOA cracked down on her. It was like a massive weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. I could finally enjoy my new home without fearing for some neighbor's daily surveillance. I must say, it felt good to take her down a notch. I'm all for maintaining a pleasant neighborhood, but there's a big difference between that and being an overzealous HOA enforcer. Thankfully, Karen learned that lesson the hard way. The HOA sues me and everybody else. Do I sue back? My HOA has over 300 homes and 5 directors. I'm one of the newly elected 2 directors that came on board 2 years ago. Ever since we got on board, the problems started. Our HOA has received a large settlement due to fires. I'm in California, and as soon as I started asking questions about how this money is spent and so on, I was excluded from the board meetings. They created an executive committee, and three of them started meeting and voting on contracts without our input. The conflict of interest eventually escalated, and the HOA has brought a complaint against 11 homeowners, including myself. The lawsuit claimed trespass and interfering with the board business. All the homeowners settled with the board, except for me. The majority settled because they did not want to or could not incur high attorney expenses. I was able to obtain some incomplete financials and found cases of overpayment, overcharging, lying on accounting documents, and so on. I exposed them to the community, but it looks like half do not care and the other half is divided. I am disappointed by the collective apathy and now I fully understand how HOA and management companies steal money from us. In my opinion, it is the new mafia. My brilliant attorney showed that there was no trespass or any kind of interference with the board business. This was all done via back and forth emails between attorneys. Six months after the initial complaint, the association submitted an amended complaint against me in November. A week later, I compelled them to produce the financial documentation regarding the settlement, and once the court date was scheduled for this, January, the HOA completely dropped their case against me, no explanation. Basically, they simply refused to show the financials and all the money that I spent defending myself and seeking the documentation is now gone. My attorney feels this was an intimidation lawsuit and their goal was to suck as much money out of me in hopes that I will stop. I would like to believe that I have some legal grounds to sue the association and get my fees back. 
My attorney is not excited about suing the HOA because the insurance will get involved and that is an endless money pit for them that I obviously do not have. Now has anyone been in a similar situation? Should I just drop this and cut the losses? I'm willing to spend some money because I feel that I'm right, but I'm not sure if it's worth it. It bothers me that they just go unpunished to be honest. Do you agree with this answer? The five-man board is the executive committee. If you can prove malfeasance, then sue them as the HOA and as individuals. If you can't prove it, then walk away. Yeah, you're going to need a lawyer that specializes in this with an ironclad case, right? I mean, I'm no lawyer myself, but you've really got to know what you're getting into. What have you done? HOA story time. Two years ago, we removed our dead fescue lawn and replaced it with Zenith Zoisha. Both grasses are allowed per the neighborhood HOA. Last year, our neighbor, who we are friendly with and our kids play together frequently, requested that I straighten out the property line because he didn't like that the zoysia goes dormant and turns brown during the winter months. I did as requested. Nothing else was said about it until about a month ago. He put hundreds of dollars worth of rocks on the same property line that I had straightened out. He said that he thought that it would stop my grass from spreading onto his lawn. Last week, he texted requesting that I meet him outside. He told me my grass was spreading into his lawn and he wanted to know what I would do about it. I told him that the HOA allows for my grass, that I didn't think it was spreading, that a lot of the brown he was seeing was due to the kids playing outside and the brown zoysia, which is still partially dormant, was just coming off by the lawn. Basically, it sheds when you're running all over it the way that we have been. He's also been dealing with infestations of Bermuda grass, which, like zoysia, goes dormant and turns brown in the winter. I offered to let him mix up some of my herbicide, which is helping me deal with the Bermuda in my lawn. He did not accept. Post our meeting, he appears to have sprayed some type of herbicide that's wiped out his fescue beyond where the rocks are. During the end of our discussion, I told him that we could install in-ground edging if that's what he wants to do, meaning that I would help him put it in. Although today, he texted stating that he believed that I would be the one to pay for it and, I believe he thinks also, put it in after asking me when I was going to do so. He does not believe he should have to pay for the edging. My wife and I feel similarly. Since I said that, he has told me, all via text, that putting in a grass that spreads was not very neighborly. I told him that I was sorry that he felt that way and reiterated that the HOA allows for my type of grass. That I had fixed the property line with my own time and effort, even though it hadn't mattered to me. That the rocks that he put in were done so without discussing it with me, but that was fine since it is his property. But that the grass that died was not a result of anything that I or the Zoisha did, and I didn't think the conversation was one to be had over a text message. There was some more back and forth, but it exceeds the character limit to include it, but the last thing that he texted was, I just reread your text. I put rocks in without discussing. You have a lot of nerve. You never discussed this grass with me at all. You just put it in. At this point, I feel like our neighbor has abandoned all sense of pleasantness, but neither of us are probably going anywhere for the next decade, and my wife and I would like to know if we are in the wrong here, and what, if anything, we should do. Are we the butt? Do you agree with this? Zoysia is tough and drought tolerant, so it's better for the environment than many other grasses. This is a ridiculous fight. Stop engaging, just shrug, and walk away. I mean, how do you go above and beyond to try to work with the situation and then the neighbor just keeps doing it? How would have you handled him? Wow. Insane HOA Karen story. I don't care what you are. You can't park in my spot. I'm a paramedic in a place that has some HOAs and apartment complexes. We hate responding to the apartment complexes because there's nothing but assigned parking and no fire zones. Basically, if we can't find a space to fit in, we have to block the road. My agency also uses first responder vehicles and ambulances. The first responder, as implied, usually arrives first, so we do our best to leave room for the ambulance to fit in. We get a call at the apartment complex and I am in the first responders. As I pull up to the address, by some miracle, there is a spot only two apartments away. Great, I can leave the road clear for the ambulance. As soon as I park, out comes this guy screaming, I can't park there. I do the, are you serious, look and just say medical emergency. He says that he doesn't care, I can't park there. Keep in mind, my vehicle has enough lights to make a Christmas tree jealous. I just grab my stuff, I lock the vehicle and keep going. 
he is screaming. He is going to call the cops. And I tell them, well, they're already on the way. <laughs> they do respond to medical emergencies. The cop gets there while I am in with the patient and tells him basically to pound salt. The cop enters the apartment and then the guy really goes full-blown entitled. He enters the apartment, comes into the room where I am treating the patient. He starts ranting and raving about how I have to move my vehicle. I look at the cop and I say, get him out of here. The cop then seals his fate. She asks the patient if she wants this person removed from the apartment and did she ever give consent for him to enter. The patient response is, get him the heck out, he's trespassing. Boom, the all clear. The cop gives him one last chance and tells him to leave or he will be arrested. He doubles down. I am on the HOA board and I can go where I please. At this point, backup is called. The cop at least manhandles him out of the room. The ambulance arrives with PD backup and they get him out of the apartment so that we can safely remove the patient. Not entirely sure what happened next, as I was in the back of the ambulance, but when I got out, one of the officers approaches and says, Hey, sorry, we need another bus. We had to tase him. Policy for PD is, if they tase someone, they have to be transported to the hospital by ambulance, to the hospital, as the taser spikes have to be surgically removed due to the barbs on them. We wait for the second ambulance, and they take him, and I go back in service. Found out a few weeks later, he was charged with trespassing, assaulting an officer, resisting arrest, interference with government administration, aka interfering with the scene of an emergency, all over a parking space that I would have been in for all of 20 minutes if he hadn't created problems. I can only assume that he took a plea deal as I was never called to testify. You ever heard the phrase, make a mountain out of a molehill? I mean, this guy just had to let the emergency services use a parking spot, and then he would be in no legal trouble. Well, he probably would have gotten in trouble down the road knowing him. What would have you done? This HOA president was terrible. So I was living a peaceful life in my cozy home on the street, blissfully unaware of the storm that was brewing just a few doors down. It all started when the ever so powerful and slightly sinister HOA president decided that he had his sights set on my house. I'd never been a part of the homeowners association, mostly because I preferred to have the freedom to paint my house any color that I please or plant whatever flowers I desired. The HOA president had always seemed to harbor a particular animosity toward me. Perhaps it was because I had a house that he secretly coveted, or maybe it was simply because I didn't conform to his vision of a perfectly manicured neighborhood. The signs of trouble began to surface when I received a letter in the mail one sunny morning. It was from the HOA, you guessed it, stating that they had placed a lien on my property for unpaid dues. It just was absurd because I wasn't even a member and I certainly hadn't received any bills from them. The HOA president was using scare tactics to force me out and I was determined not to give in. I knew my rights and I knew that they could not legally put a lien on my property. I decided to confront that HOA president, hoping that a simple conversation could resolve the matter. I knocked on his door. My heart was pounding in my chest as I prepared for our showdown. The HOA president, with a smug grin on his face, welcomed me into his living room. What brings you here, neighbor? He asked, feigning politeness. I cut right to the chase. Mr. President, I am not a part of the HOA, and I've never received any bills from you. Why'd you put a lien on my house? He chuckled condescendingly and said, Oh, you see, there must have been a mix-up, but if you can cooperate and sell me your house, we can make this all go away. It's a win-win for both of us. I was just taken aback by his audacity. He wanted my house, and he wasn't even trying to hide it anymore. HOA, Mr. President, I'm not selling my home. This is my property, and you have no right to do this. His face turned red with anger, and he shouted, If you don't cooperate, I'll make sure that lien sticks, and you'll have a hard time ever selling your house to anyone else. I left his house, seething with anger and frustration. It was clear that the HOA president was willing to go to great lengths to get what he wanted, but I wasn't about to back down. So I decided to do some digging of my own. I went to the county office to check the records, and what I discovered left me in shock. The HOA president had tried to put the lien on my house under the table without the knowledge of the rest of the HOA. It was a blatant violation of their rules, and he had knowingly hidden it from everyone else. Armed with this evidence, I attended the next HOA meeting. 
I presented the documents that proved the HOA president's deceit. The room fell silent as everyone looked at the incriminating paperwork. The atmosphere in the room grew tense, and the tension was palpable. The other board members were a mix of shock and anger. They exchanged uneasy glances, realizing the magnitude of the HOA president's actions. The HOA president's face turned ashen, and he just stammered, This is all a misunderstanding, and never intended for this to happen. It's a clerical error. But the other board members were not convinced. They were furious at the breach of trust. One of them, she was a tall and stern woman, spoke up. Her voice was just quivering with anger at this point. HOA president, you've crossed a line that can't be ignored. You are dismissed from the HOA board, effective immediately. The room erupted into a heated debate as other board members voiced their outrage. The confrontation was fierce, and it was clear that the majority stood with the evidence and the rules of the HOA. The HOA president was ousted, though, and my house was free from the wrongful lien. As I walked out of that meeting, I couldn't help but feel a sense of triumph. The HOA president's jealousy and greed had finally caught up with them, and justice had prevailed. I returned home, relieved that my house was safe from the clutches of this power-hungry former HOA president. Away story time. I was having a great day, that is, until HOA Karen decided to rear her ugly head. Seriously, I have to tell you what happened. So my wife and kids and I, we'd always loved our house and our lawn. It was nestled in the heart of a friendly suburban neighborhood. It was a huge upgrade from our last place, and we were in love with it. But there was one dark cloud that loomed over our American dream white picket fence life. The Homeowners Association and its notorious member, HOA Karen. Just think of the ugliest witch that you saw this past Halloween. Yeah, that's only like a quarter as ugly as this Karen. She's so awful, she makes the Grinch jealous. But yeah, we'd heard tales of her petty squabbles and the havoc that she'd end up wreaking on the neighbors, but nothing prepared us for the ordeal that was about to unfold. So it all started with our house, right? Ours was beautiful, slightly larger than the rest, with a charming white picket fence and a well-landscaped front yard. It wasn't ridiculously huge, just a bit more spacious, and Karen couldn't seem to handle us being so happy. She'd often peer out of her living room window, glaring at us, as we spent time in our yard. It was kind of unsettling, but we tried our best to ignore her, because, I mean, like, what else are you going to do? Well, come to find out, I spoke too soon. One day, as we were enjoying a family barbecue in our backyard, which is grilling steaks, I mean, I'm a dad, it's what we do, medium is the best way, right? We saw Karen venture past our property line, into our yard, as if marking her territory like a strange mutt with an ego, so far from home, trying to be that king of the castle or the neighborhood. I approached her and politely asked her to just respect our boundaries, but she brushed me off, claiming she had a right to keep an eye on us. What a creep. Well, things took a terrifying turn one night. We were in our living room, watching a movie, when a loud crash shattered our peace and quiet. We were startled, and we just rushed to the front of the house to find a brick had been hurled through our window, shards of our glass just covering the floor. My family was shaken, and anger coursed through my veins. I knew, I knew deep down, that Karen was responsible, but we couldn't prove it. Determined to catch her in the act, we installed security cameras and replaced the window, we even decided to get a new mailbox, and I just couldn't help but taunt her a little bit. I hope you don't think I'm too rude, but I have to tell you what I did to her. So I told her, Karen, we just love this new mailbox. It's so sturdy and secure, and doesn't it look nice in front of our happy little home? I mentioned it to her during one of our rare encounters, and we watched as her eyes flashed with irritation before she turned away. Sure enough, the very next day, we heard a loud banging outside. Rushing to the window, we found Karen attempting to break our new mailbox with a baseball bat. But what she didn't know was that we had reinforced it with rebar. <laughs> the sucker took the bait, hook, line, and sinker. The loud clang was followed by her painful scream, and we had it all on video. With clear evidence in hand, we took the matter to the HOA president and consulted our lawyer. The video left no room for doubt. Karen was caught red-handed. The case went to a hearing, and Karen was found guilty. The HOA imposed heavy fines on her, and she was ordered to repair the window and the mailbox that she had damaged. We'd also received restitution for the damages inflicted on our home. Our once pleasant suburban life began to regain its tranquility as Karen was forced to back down. It was a hard-fought battle, but we were able to put an end to the HOA Karen's reign of terror. 
With her financial penalties and mandatory repairs, Karen was humbled and we never heard from her again. Our neighborhood, once shadowed by the specter of an overbearing HOA member, was free to flourish as a close-knit community. We celebrated our victory, cherishing our newfound peace and the safety of our family. HOA story time with an update. About two years ago, we decided that our townhouse's yard sucked because it was a 20 by 20 square of grass that was good for nothing but irritating lawnmowers. So we decided what wouldn't suck was a 20 by 20 patio. And in that patio, we wanted fire like any good American pyromaniac household. So after HOA applications and neighbor approvals and one bout of hysterical weeping over the cost of hiring a landscape architect, we installed a patio and a fireplace. And all was good, until about three months later, when I get a call from the HOA rep that goes something like this. Hello? He says, uh, we have a problem. Well, that's unfortunate for you. It's about your fireplace. You mean the one that you approved in May? As in May, and it's now November? Well, it shouldn't be there. It's against fire code. Well, it weighs 7,000 pounds, and you approved it so it ain't moving. Didn't you get the county to check on this? It's clearly against fire code. Tell you what, you send me the statute that you think we're violating, and I'll talk to our landscape architect. Here's my email. I give him my email reserved for idiots and spam bots. One email and a few clicks later, I realize they're looking at my county's regs toward bonfires and fire pits. And I'm gonna assume that 7,000 pounds indicates that this is neither of those things. It's a fireplace, which is specifically listed in the fire code, but then not regulated. I forward this email to my landscape architect, and she then calls me with the county fire chief on the line, and we laugh for a good 10 minutes. I email the HOA back politely. Dear freaking HOA moron, you recently called me erroneously, assuming our fireplace fell under the regulations. It does not. Our fire chief, my landscape architect, and my basic reading comprehension have all confirmed this. If you want to continue to argue that I need to go through significant expense to remove a $10,000 fixture from my property, you'll need to provide your council's information so that mine can contact them. Kindly leave me the heck alone. Five weeks pass with no contact from the HOA. After this time, I get a letter informing me that my fireplace can only burn wood and no hazardous materials. The HOA has said crap to me since. An update. They have returned. Now they've sent a polite letter to the entire neighborhood as a reminder that grills must be operated 15 feet from the house and not on the deck. What bull crap is this? I mutter to myself as we grill burgers on the deck, seeing that they've cited the fire code. Again. And to their credit, I look at my county's fire code. It does state that no charcoal cooker, smoker, grill, or any flammable liquid or liquefied petroleum gas-fired stove or similar devices shall be ignited or used on the balconies or spaces under the balconies of any structure, unless approved by the fire marshal. These devices can be used at ground level if at least 15 feet from any structure. Of course, that statute is also followed by exceptions, electric grills and other devices approved by the fire marshal, detached one and two family dwellings and townhouses, and we're in a community of townhouses. As of this week, my second grill has been assembled on my deck. I await the upcoming HOA phone call as the bow hunter waits for a deer to close that last few feet. What do you think about standing up to the HOA? What would have you done? Karen tows my car off of my property. Click the video on your screen to find out what happens to Karen and I'll see you there.